Okay, in this video, I'm gonna talk about cinematic storytelling. What is that anyways? Location. Ska vi åka Tristan? I'm out biking with the kids, but see you soon. <laughs> okay, hello. Uh, so today it's gonna be all about cinematic storytelling. Uh, let me know like what you want to know, but I thought I'd just like get two questions that I got beforehand. Like, uh, let's see here. Josul MSK, I don't know if that's the right one. Um, what is cinematic storytelling? Why is that confused with slow mo or black bars or orange teal? Uh, lol, be cool to talk about what's not cinematic and what makes something cinematic. That's what this is going to be all about. Like, why that isn't necessarily cinematic. Now, I use like 235 black bars and all that, so I would say that that is like part of it. Uh, and slow mo, I use that sometimes, but I also hate on it all the time. So it kind of depends. Uh, but I'll get into that. Uh, another question that I got was uh, from Detlev Eller. Probably trash that all the way. Um, define cinematic storytelling. I tend to think that there are two sides to cinematic coin. Uh, what is the filmmaking techie th what the filmmaking techie thinks versus what the audience experience as such food for thought that's exactly what like i want to get into uh, in this session here because i think that's the biggest misconception in some way that like the technical aspects of it us as filmmakers we focus on one thing uh, and all the time like that is like how do you tell a story that like you know, kind of what looks good, what is like the most cinematic in terms of like in a way I think close to Hollywood. Like how do you get a film to look or feel as close to Hollywood as you can uh, without even having money or with doing a doc. Um, but that is not necessarily what cinematic is. Like there's tons of people that have made like cinematic films for Hollywood or like the French wave or whatever it is um, but they've done it with like documentary means so to me cinematic storytelling is like reinterpreting life cinematically and that can be done in like a million ways and there's no like right or wrong but there is like a way of pushing out the audience or getting them more immersed into the story that's what the conflict is about when i talk about like i hate uh, slow motion that's what i i mean when i say that that like i hate when you use it and then it just bores the hell out of me and i don't want to watch it because it's just like it looks like everything else it's just generic there's no thought of like behind using it it's just making it slow mo because um, it looks cinematic that's not cinematic Cinematic is when you use it to tell something and to emphasize like emotions and to bring the viewer into the story and closer to the story, to be more immersed into the story. Uh, to me, that's what cinematic is. Like cinematic language is like bringing the viewer into the story more. If you don't do that, then it's not cinematic. It doesn't matter if it's like 120p or if it's black bars or if it's fancy b-roll. doesn't matter at all. If it just pushes you out of the story, then, you know, it's not cinematic to me. So, what do you think about that comment? Um, but in terms of what it is, like what is cinematic storytelling, I would say, like the language in itself, I would define that as being, for instance, story, it would be location, uh, atmosphere, action, light, music. All those things make up what we see as like the cinematic language. So then you use that to tell the story. So you use light to set a mood, for instance. Or you use the atmospheres or the locations to tell a story or the characters. Uh, it's not about you, know, you putting a camera in one place. That doesn't make it cinematic at all. It's about using the different nuances of life, like what you can capture in life and tell a story with. That's what the cinematic like, language itself is. So it could be words, but it could also not be words. That's where it gets kind of complex. 
but I would also say like using for instance like this has been forever in cinema but like when you use metaphors rather than using like just people saying what it is like when you can interpret life or make it simplified by using a metaphor then that will make people oftentimes could distract people as well but oftentimes it helps people to understand something complex and that's what you want to use the cinematic language for to kind of make it easier for people to get into a story and understand issues that you're trying to talk about um, but it's also about for instance subtext so when people speak they usually don't like any conflict you have with like your girlfriend or whatever it is like your friend or your brother whoever colleague at work if you have a conflict with somebody most people do not say what they truly mean or what they truly feel that's just the way it is and that's what like the cinematic language focuses on is the subtext like what is being thought behind what is said so when you say things like when you act when you work in fiction for instance and that's where i come from before i did docs when you work in fiction all you do is try to work on the subtext and as soon as you let like the subtext float to the surface and people are talking about like oh i feel so bad for instance that's when you feel like it's fake and it's the same when you are doing that when you do docs because when you are letting like the obvious stuff float up like let's say we talk about an orange and you show an orange then you starting to like lose trust in this filmmaker because they're using like elemental things that you should be beyond at this stage like when you're making films for other people to watch and to consume you're gonna be judged just like like michael like any like big director would be like it's not a difference if you're like Michael Winterbottom, uh, Martin Scorsese, it doesn't matter who you are. You're still going to be judged on the same level as them in terms of your storytelling skills, whatever level you're at. Sure, you can go to school and you can be like, you can get a pass or you, something like that. But still, people will always judge you upon that thing. So I think like when you are like telling a story, when you focus on the subtext, that's when people are like getting closer to the show not tell type of uh, thinking so like in fiction it's quite easy because you can act things out you can tell somebody to go and act something that they're not saying like they can show it with their body language but when you do docs you're the one that needs to capture that you need to visualize that how you do that that's the hard part but you're the one that needs to interpret what you see in a scene, for instance. Instead of like trying to show whatever is happening, four people talking, you show a wide shot of four people because you think you need all the coverage you can have of them. You don't need that. You need to like get into the story. What are you trying to say with the story? Try to show that, that subtext. Like try to hone in on that with the visual language that you're trying to use in terms of like the cinematic storytelling. Yeah, and that could be like sound and stuff too but just in terms of camera you would like maybe focus in on something that's more subjective rather than showing everything so if it is a scene where it's actually about getting into a character's mind you would not like show just the scene play out you would need to pick a perspective to make the audience understand that like, okay, now you're watching this reality here, but you should watch it from this angle or from this perspective. That's what the cinematic language is for. Like trying to get the audience to view life or the scene or whatever it is in a certain perspective. When you manage to do that, people get immersed and they understand the story on a deeper level. Um, and I mean, you can visualize inner thoughts as well. So you can like emotionally put the viewer into a place where they feel and understand what's going on on a deeper level. Um, I think that's the biggest, biggest thing. Uh, and if you do all that, then that's when you start to like tell a story with a show, not tell perspective of things. So just letting like action play out and then you capture that and you package it through the cinematic storytelling uh, yeah that's at least what I would like summarize it as
So let's see if we got some questions here. Uh, uh, uh. What do you feel, think about film school and high school? I think everybody could get their film school online and just go out and work. But I mean, if it's a, it's a two-sided coin. If you're a person that is driven and will go out and just make stuff and has like a momentum in in their filmmaking, then you don't need film school. Um, and if you need film school to get motivated, there's a big chance that you won't get motivated in film school. So that's like a big dilemma. But if you would, like I went to school, like studying, um, so complex, like motion graphics and uh, 3D and like digital post-production, like After Effects, that type of stuff and editing. And then I realized that this is not what I want to do. And I want to work with film, like photography, DOPing. And then I started doing that and started to switch all my courses over. And then I found what I wanted to do. But that was a like big detour to what I could have done. Like I would rather go like an assistant route and just get into the industry and build connections and then like learn stuff on the side and make films all the time. Yeah, that's at least my opinion. But just to get on to like why avoid 120 frames per second and B-roll because I've said this before and it, it's funny because I think that a lot of people like they get so I say this and I never do it kind of thing. I always use B-roll. I always use 120p. But the ambition is always to use it to tell something like to tell a story yeah. and i mean when you do videos online sometimes you you don't do that all you're trying to do is is not bore people and just get them to watch an info info video of something like this site site learndocumentary.com or this youtube channel it's based around learning so in a sense, like this Q&A, the short videos that are more tutorial based, I don't care so much about like, I, I would like to if I had the time, but in order for us to like be frequent, we have to kind of, okay, we have to get it out. So we might not do it as we would if we wanted to tell a story. But what I'm talking about when I say like, don't do 120p and B-roll is don't do it if you want to tell a story and if you want to get people more emotionally engaged in something. And I get this comment a lot just because I did that B-roll uh, video a while back where I said, shoot, don't shoot B-roll. And I think a lot of people misinterpret it as like, you should never shoot anything that is other than what's going on, the action that's going on. And I'm saying the opposite. You should pick a perspective and tell a story and show a scene and like tell a story in in a cinematic way like using the cinematic language like I just talked about and if you do that with b-roll then perfect do it but if you use it to kind of layer things and not bore people then you're way off then you are boring people and you are looking generic and boring like just a copy of somebody else. And it's the same for 120p. Like when you use 120p, just as you use music, for instance, uh, or silence, like when you use those things to get an effect, then it works perfectly. But if you just layer a whole video with music, it just gets like repetitive and people stop thinking about it. And it's exactly the same with 120p and it's exactly the same with b-roll if you're repeating the same type of plays and stuff and it's the same angle but a little different then nobody cares about the image in the end nobody cares that you could do like five slides in a row like that doesn't matter people get like less immersed into the story if you think about it that way so that's like the biggest issue i have with it is that youtube is so full of that and I think certain people have made it into a style and certain people use it in a good way. But there's so many people copying it and it's become a trend. Just like the 5D short depth of field was when I made like Zero Silence, which is exactly that short depth of field. That is like a trend that will 
be dated to this time. And if you want to be unique, you should move away from those things and you should try to find your like way of doing it. Uh, and I would not say like, do not use any of it, but in order for some people to start thinking, I think you need to say that. Uh, so that's just my feelings about it. I don't know what you <laughs> think about the whole slow mo thing. I think that if you use it in a in like a creative way, where you're looking at the story, uh, you're trying to get people more immersed. Like when you switch from 24 or 25p into 120p, that creates a, a strong emotion and it, it switches something in the mind of the viewer. And to overuse that well that loses its power and it's the same when you like put a track on when you have everything like minimal and then all of a sudden there there's this big song that comes on then you get emotions out of it but i hear this all the time i listened to a, an audiobook today when i was riding my bike and i was just like oh okay so now they're putting the sentimental track on and now i should care but i don't i just get distracted by it i just start listening to the music and just feel like this is so shitty that like this level of talent in terms of like uh, a creator is so low and it happens the same thing when I see the videos that are like overusing 120p or b-roll and, and music and all that like, when you use it in a good way perfect when you use it in the wrong way destroys your potential to tell the story uh, but yeah let me know what you think let me see here. We got some questions. Uh, how would you light something in a cinematic way? Evan asked. I think in general, I think the best way to do it in docs is usually to just have one light source uh, because you don't have time to like set lights up uh, like this studio has. Uh, so I would usually like use the, the light that is in the room or outside or whatever it is to work with the light. So uh, if, when I was riding my bike today, for instance, I was filming myself and like the light was coming from this side. And as long as you look to that side, then you're gonna have like good lighting. So you would always have to adapt to things uh, if you wanna shoot in natural light. So you would have to turn the action in a way where you get the light in the most cinematic way. But the thing is that like, everything that is being lit is being lit to imitate the sun uh, most of the time. Or if it's just like indoors, it's, it's just yeah, the ambient lighting. Um, but if you look at, for instance, Christopher Doyle uh, and his films, especially like the Von Carvai stuff that he's done, um, he uses a lot of ambient light and it looks like it looks so freaking good. Yeah, that's what I get inspired by in terms of lighting because I want to be able to work that way. I think you can today because you have so light sensitive cameras and, and low noise. So you could shoot most of the stuff uh, with just ambient light, but you would have to direct the scenes to take place in the right places where you have good lighting. Uh, but if you want to light things, I would try to stick to like one light source on the person so you would not like have the three point lighting and try to get like the shadows up instead like use the shadows uh, light if you want to have like a light maybe you would put it here and then you would get like this nice shadow maybe you would get a little bit of light in the face or something but uh, if you work like that then, then you get a more interesting look to it yeah, i think this is i talked about this in the cinematic lighting video i did a way back but Look at that if you want to understand how I'm, I'm like talking about this. But um, then I would add maybe one light in the background or something to create like a 3D plane. Uh, but that could be it. But I would always like try to use natural light and get good at that because it's super important. Like if you, if you can't use natural light, it's so hard to do, make things look good uh, because you never have time when you do docs. Uh, okay, so let me see. Let me just sum up what I was thinking about today. So cinematic storytelling 
to me it's like it's perspective storytelling so you need to pick for the story whatever it is like what's the right perspective to tell the story and to get the audience more immersed into the story uh, and you you do that by telling the story with a concept and a visual language that you set out to create and once you have that you try to like emphasize emotions by using that language um, and you use like the whole medium so it's like audio sound design music video action everything together um, and then like i would try to stay away from like interviews as the driving force in terms of telling a story i would try to get everything acted out if i can so the hard thing when you direct docs is to actually like the direction happens before you get on set or or on location so you need to kind of set up the right scenes that can bring out the type of story that you're trying to tell and that can be kind of hard if you haven't done like docs before to see how a situation is gonna like play out but with some experience this becomes easier and easier and i think the more people do it the less they are depending on on interviews but in the beginning it's easy to get like all driven like the narrative being driven by the interviews um, but I think the more you do it you just get less interested in that and try to just use as much of the cinematic language as you can and the quicker you get better at it the better the films will be um, but just focus on like how to get the, the audience into the story that would be my like biggest thing uh, like just focus on that how do you get them into the story and feel like they're close to the characters and sitting there next to them uh, and just experiencing things how do you use the camera to achieve that is it just by doing like handheld stuff or is it just doing wide shots and just waiting for things like there's tons of ways and it all comes down to like what you're interested in what type of uh, style you like and that sort of thing yeah, but when you do master like for instance the subtext it's so much easier to kind of it's so much easier to understand what type of situations you need as well so when you understand how subtext is like showing itself in in their storyline you can pick up on things and you can get like certain shots that can emphasize that but you need to really analyze everything all the time in order for you to see that yeah. And I would also like use locations to strengthen the story because if you use the locations to be a part of like almost like a character in the story you can emphasize like the story concept as well. So once you do that you will get like people to be more they, it becomes easier to visualize things when you have the story. Uh, be close to the location and have everything like just go together to strengthen the story that's the biggest use for it as as i see it i try to cast people that has like a strong uh, location narrative within their lives because then it becomes easier to use the the whole place as well um, and then also like look at how you can use light to tell a story so if you want to use like one point light or whatever it is like just think about like when do you want to shoot it do you want to shoot it everything at sunrise everything at sunset like use that to create a cinematic language it's, it's just about like limiting yourself as well so just pick a concept that you like and try to stick to it to create a consistency um, within the film because otherwise like if you do too many things if you once you do the slider then you do a gimbal then you do this then you do that if you use too many of those things you lose the the language uh, that you're trying to create because it's all about creating this story world and if you can use like certain tools for instance more consistent or like a 24 millimeter throughout a whole uh, film or something like that that in itself that limitation creates a language so that's how certain films they just look that way because there wasn't resources so you were just forced to do it but those will always like they will look more consistent which i tend to like um yeah and let me see what i've written down yeah and also like music themes as well because usually you you 
especially when you work with these stock sites it's easy to just pick a track and then you just work with that but I would also if if I make a film I'm looking more towards like what type of themes are I am I trying to create like am I trying to build a certain type of sound for a certain location or certain type of sound for a whole uh, film like work to get the audio and music to also be a part of the story because just putting like songs in just to get an um, emotional response that rarely like it doesn't translate 100% it just becomes something but it, it doesn't really bring you in there fully uh, and I think that's like it's, it, it, you can do better than that um, but other than that like I was thinking about uh, Pearl of Africa and we had what was it we did like our concept and theme for instance we did a we shot the whole film the Pearl of Africa we shot the whole film and it was like a lot of trips like she fled from uh, Uganda to Kenya uh, she went from uh, Nairobi to Mombasa. She went to back to Uganda. Uh, we went to Thailand. So there was like several journeys within the journey. And in the first cut, we used like everything as chronological because you pr you usually do that to understand the story. So you lay out it chronologically, and then you start like moving things around. So we did that, and then we realized that so this is not a film about uh, like her just documenting her we need to like narrow it down and tighten it up in terms of the theme and and the whole structure so what we did was to just put everything together cut everything out that said or implied that this was several journeys and then we just made it into one emotional journey and then we used a train ride that was one journey to just lay that out throughout the whole film in order to package it into one journey. And then there was a plane ride uh, as well, but all that was just to make like a structure that you could easily follow along and it was easier to understand her journey because the film is is about like one journey that she's on. Um, but you could have like made people confused and all that if you don't simplify it. So I, I always try to work with like the structure to just simplify it and it's the same what people are saying as well. Trying to just simplify it down and reinterpret things in the most cinematically uh, engaging way. So that doesn't mean just like showing things as they are and it doesn't mean like being afraid to, to lie in a sense because it's just trying, you, trying to get to the real truth which Werner Herzog talks a lot about. Like the, the real truth is something other than just showing and documenting life. Like there's a deeper truth behind all that. And that's what you should try to like capture with the cinematic language. So if you do that, you make those choices to move away from what you actually shot and to simplify it for people to actually understand it. Because otherwise they might not. Uh, so that's an important thing I think to think about like how you do that um, and then like just using the the uh, three act structure as well to make people you know to structure things in a way that they understand uh, that's the way I would do it if I was starting out I would try to use the three act structure uh, at the beginning at least and then I could move away from the la it later but it's easy to get like just bored by that whole thing. I get so bored by it because Hollywood is so boring to me. So just looking at how all the films are just uh, templated by the three act structure. If you don't know what the three act structure is, it's basically just like you have first an introduction to the character and the problem. And then you have like the, uh, the that's the first act. The second act is pretty much going on this journey to kind of overcome that problem. And then the, in the end of that one, you fail. And then the last one, you just go on this last mission to succeed. And maybe you don't or you do. But that it becomes so predictable. So trying to like be surprising within that 
in terms of structure is super effective but i would like to just do it first the way that like the traditional way of doing things is so i laid out for instance the pearl of africa first all the film chronologically and just told the story like a three x structure and then we started to move it around it's much easier that way especially if you're starting out okay so let me get a question here um matt piercy i'm trying to stay away from needing uh, to do documentary interview style shots and more fly on the wall how much do you direct the conversation storytelling while in the moment with people do you handle uh, one-on-one -on -one multiple people in a scene differently i'm not sure if i should keep a list of questions on hand uh, to throw in when i see uh, lighting uh, when i see lighting and composition naturally lining up while running and gunning thanks hopefully i can catch this live um I mean, mainly for me, it comes down to directing beforehand. So like picking the scene and where to have it and where to start it, that type of stuff. Yeah. And it's a conversation. First, it's like a research stage where you do uh, like pre-interviews with the people you're going to meet. Yeah. And then I usually have like a casting person that is doing a lot of research and talking to the people. But... If you don't have that, you would do that all on your own. And then once you get there, I would usually sit down with that person and talk first and then with the character. But if you're doing it yourself, you would probably talk with the character. So then I would just sit down and ask them like, okay, so uh, before and I've made up my mind, okay, these scenes are what I want to have. And then I've done a lot of research to kind of come to that conclusion that these are the scenes that I want. But then I sit down with them and I talk like, okay, so... I was thinking this and that, uh, can we do that? Can we go to this? Um, and then you have to like strike out. A lot of them won't happen, not possible, not possible. And then you try to rework and ask like, okay, but what are you going to do now that we're here? Like what's happening? How can we do this? How can we show this? How can we, uh, what are you doing uh, around this and that? Like trying to fish for different things that could happen and different uh, more cinematic scenes is usually what I try to get so if you look at Kino for instance when we were there I was fishing for a couple of scenes uh, there was one place which is like a, a festival ground where the the town is kind of threatened by this mining uh, mill that's right on the doorstep to this festival so it's it's really loud and like it, they f are afraid that people won't come to the festival and that type of thing. So that felt like a super cinematic thing. You have like, what is it, like 50 meters or something like that. And then you're standing with the mill and you have like this big complex of a mill um, down in the valley. And, and that was like a super visual thing. So I wanted to have that. And I also wanted to capture like the nature. So having people out just in wide shots a lot in the, in the nature to make that a part of the story because it's such a vast nature and um, and we went fishing in a canoe and stuff just to kind of show that as well to create those scenes where the story itself it comes in naturally uh, within like what's happening so the way I direct it is usually just to to kind of make those scenes happen and then I just start the scene and I just follow along and we'll see what we get type of thing. Um, and usually I don't direct much uh, in terms of that. Uh, sometimes though, especially when I've just met someone, you usually want to ask them question and make it feel like a conversation um, at times. But sometimes you need to tell them to shut up as well and just uh, follow them. So it, it kind of depends on that. Like... In an ideal scenario, I would just want to follow them. But sometimes you so have to like make stuff much quicker. Uh, and then I might like do everything at once. But now I feel comfortable with that. Like when I was earlier in my career, I didn't. So then I was more just like working with interviews and that sort of thing. And then uh, getting more B-roll type of storytelling. Uh, I stay away from that now because it's much easier to just start a scene and then you're you're getting like real moments and real 
things happening and then you just need to bring that home in your camera <laughs> and that's the challenge uh, the challenge isn't so much like directing uh, when the camera is rolling at least yeah i think that answers it right Uh, 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 okay, let's see. Okay, Leo asks, hey dude, I would like to know how much time uh, you took to plan the doc you're currently shooting, research schedule, etc. Uh, it took... Uh, can I see that somewhere? That don't really know. Let me see if I check. Uh, 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 new film behind the scenes. Let's see here. Dates on this. It's good to document things. <laughs> um, casting was done when? May this year. 19th of May. Okay, so that's when like the casting was done. When did we get the Ursa? Okay, that's the wrong date. Okay, in March. Okay. I guess, like, because the, st the story that we're making, it started as a different type of project where it was, like, four, four stories in the world. And then when we got to Kino, we r realized that, okay, this is a TV series in itself. We probably need to take this out and then we make the film, but we focus on this for now because this is so good. Uh, so I think that like the whole, the beginning of that project was as we were premiering the Pearl of Africa uh, or European premiere in 2016, I think. No, to, yeah, 2016 in November. So that was the first time I pitched the ID just randomly to random people at the festival, just to try it out, like my concept. And then, of course, from that, we've done a lot of research. Uh, it's changed a couple of times. I think we first started to shoot in Sweden. Uh, we've shot with that character two times. So about like a week and a half to in total. And then we shot in Lofoten um, in about a, yeah, a week or so, I think we shot. Uh, and then all that was like the cornerstone and then uh, Kino as well and then we haven't shot in South Africa which we were planning but now it's probably going to be on hold for a while but that whole concept was a little bit different because the same idea actually exists within Kino but it's just more focused around this community so it's just a, a different type of story but that's a long time but it just goes on and off like we started getting funding for this in the spring I think let me see uh, here we go yeah in the spring so in March we got funded to do the Kino uh, stuff and make a trailer and then do the crowdfunding campaign and the web series so the first web series that we did we did that with some funding so it's just like the continuation that we're trying to crowdfund so we had an opportunity to to get a like an innovation grant so we got that off of having done the the stuff on the feature film which was these other places but then we realized now when we got the keynote that we probably need to like focus this and make a new application just to make this a TV series instead. So it kind of changes all along. Uh, and I mean, it became two films instead of one. Um, but it's a long time and it just goes like on and off in between our commercial stuff. Uh, and we also like do other films for TV uh, that are more Swedish based, but it's it's just like a thing that has to go as it goes you can't really like stress the process of making a doc it usually takes like three years to make one uh, and that's natural but it is like a long time in between everything you need to wait for things so next week is it next week yeah next week 
were like going to the Swedish Film Institute to report this project and to tell them, oh, this was a success. And then we can apply for funding for like the next stage. So it's such a slow process where you have like at least half a year or even more a year sometimes before like you get to like the next level, next level. So it's kind of dreadful in that sense. And that's why we have so many projects going on at the same time. So even if like this project is one project, but we have two other TV series that we're doing in a feature film. So all those run parallel and, and some die and then they never happen and other films just get paused or they are really slow or yeah, that's just the way it goes. Um, let me see here. Did I scroll? Okay, here we go. Uh, Ar Alex uh, R. Yeah, in documentaries, how do you prepare and structure your story before or after you shoot interviews? Do you have an end or conclusion before you start production? Like the the problem with interviews, for instance, is that you usually don't you don't get that good answers, and I don't think you get like this perfect voiceover from doing interviews. Uh, for Pearl of Africa, for instance, I actually. Like I had done everything off of interviews. We've fin finished um, the whole film and everything. But then I went to... Let me think. Yeah, the European premiere in Amsterdam. And I made like a makeshift type of uh, audio booth. It's actually pretty funny. I don't know if we used much of it. There is like behind the scenes of this. In our hotel room. So we put the beds together, blankets, all that sound booth. And then me and Cleo sat in there and recorded the voiceover that's in the film. Um, just to get it more intimate. Because I felt like the, the voice that we had from the interviews wasn't good enough and it wasn't intimate enough and it wasn't like spot on. So we just really recorded what she had said. So I just brought that out as a script and then we just read those lines and I think it worked really good but um, that's how I've approached it now much more so in the places where I am I stopped filming interviews as much as I can so I just do the sound recorded interviews but usually I don't see the point in doing any interviews the first time I'm shooting something the second time is like when you've processed it a bit and you can get a better interview off of people uh, so usually I just ask stuff, but it's uh, like as we're doing things and filming things. So they're just talking in in real life and then we're filming that. So I don't do like sit down interviews. Um, yeah, sometimes I do, but it just depends on the situation. Uh, but other uh, just to talk about like the process in itself, I usually do a lot of uh, research on the topic and stuff. So for Kino, for instance, we... Uh, I discovered this article in New York Times and then Andre started contacting him and they had like a big back and forth trying to like get uh, more understanding of the story and then trying to get some suggestions for characters and all that. Uh, and then all that like went on for a long time. I'm not so involved in that until we get to like a certain type of uh, suggestions for characters and I need to kind of look at those and look at uh, what type of characters there are and try to pick somebody that feels right. So we do pre-interviews to determine that and we try to use like as much info as we have on people. Um, and then when I have that, I, I go and shoot as we have done all that research. Yeah. And then I sit down, as I t said earlier, to talk to them and ask what's possible with the plan I have, like how do we need to adapt it? Um, and then like that's turned upside down all the time and you need to like rework everything uh, and reevaluate what your intent is all the time. But let's just look at like five like pillars of um, doc storytelling in general like how you create cinematic stories because you have the narrative structure and why this is so important is that like this is like in the linear storytelling it would be like beginning middle and end happening chronologically 
But if you don't want it to be chronologically, you need to have a structure that makes sense for people. So in Pearl of Africa, it was a train ride. That's like one journey. It, it, it makes a structure in the film that means that they are going on this one big journey. And when you use it like that, it becomes like a, a reinterpretation of life. And that's why finding your structure for your film in terms of how to package your your whole story or storyline in the best cinematic way that's what it is that that's something that you need to develop and then you have like the narrative setting which is super important to me at least to find like the right setting because that keeps people more committed into the story if you find the right like location and stuff that has a, a bigger role than just being a location then you're starting to like get people more involved because of that and that's why it's super important to like capture people's attention as well um and yeah and then you also have like the voice of the story which is super important so a narrative voice can of course be like a voiceover or something but it could also just be how you're telling the story so you need to find whatever is right for the story, whatever that, um, how do you make that in the most cinematic way? And to me, like cinematic is the same for all these things. Like you need to look at how do you make a voice like translate from being just somebody talking into being something bigger than that, to be something that really like brings you into this story world. So when you look at like story narrative, like voice narratives, and you look at it that way, it becomes something different than just an interview. And that's what I think people kind of need to just focus in on their story. How did they tell that? Um, and then you have like the theme of everything. So the narrative theme. And the theme in itself, like for us, you could like look at it as different things, but you should focus on one in the end. So while we're doing the film, like it could be in Kino about community, but it could also be about like uh, mining or it could be about just human nature, how people relate to each other. And it depends on like what the story is in the end, but you need a theme to, to make things fall into place and make it easier to for people to understand the story and keep them interested in the story so when you have a theme try to think about all the scenes and all the cinematic storytelling that you do everything that you're trying to achieve with the cinematic language should come back to this theme and and be connected to it all these like things should connect to each other and, and should like emphasize each other um and then lastly you have like the tone of everything like what mood are you trying to uh, to uh, use to tell the story that can be like lighting it could be the colors in the grade all those things like the tone is super important to get people immersed into the story and it creates a consistency in the cinematic storytelling so using tone to really hone in on on a feeling or something that makes people more engaged or more even here closer to the story that's super important um yeah that's that's what i think at least um what's the uh, boyan damjanovic i think i didn't break that totally what's the best way to introduce character in xxx movie there's this fantastic video i think you can just search for it um how spielberg introduces characters i think there is there are so many ways to do it but i think he is a genius in that sense that you can really see how how big of a difference it does when you actually can find a scene that really just like captures the story and, and this character in one scene yeah. and i think if you can get that you need these iconic scenes if you can get them i haven't been able to get that but that's what i'm going for with like stuff that i do now i really try to get like the most like sharp, short type of scene that can really show this character in a short, short video or a short, short scene that just captures everything. And you just have it. You're just there as an audience. You, you understand this. I just want to see more. When you have that, it, it's just so much more engaging. So that's what I think people should at least like 
uh, try to get uh, but search for that video it's amazing um, I don't remember what the film is that they have in it so just like where do you start with like all of this I think you really need to start with like learning the story you need to do all the research like research people research places research events related to the film that in itself would deepen your understanding of of like this world in general and then that you need to reinterpret into a cinematic like translation of that what is that well that comes down to like your style and all those things as well but when you have all that knowledge it's so much easier to like interpret it cinematically so just study that as much as you can in terms of like theme and uh, and just the background and research everything that you can uh, because that will make it much deeper and, and less shallow of a film and you're gonna get like much more ideas of how you can tell it cinematically when you've done that work and then usually when i've done that i i start to work out like a a mood board of some sort where i put up like inspiration uh, images or that sort of thing to kind of hone in on a style so for this film kino that we're making i wanted everything to be wide shot and and to use much more of the environments and and most of the stuff being like around 20 millimeter to 24 millimeter on a super uh, 35 sensor and I just feel like that was something that I want to explore in this one and, and not go like you, I can go close, but I want to do wide close ups and, and also do like the 235 um, perspective. And when you work like that and use that limitation, when you decide on that, that creates a certain look in itself. And, and that's what you want to do in this stage, like decide on focal lengths. Um, do you want to go handheld or gimbal? This was a conversation that me and Maddie has had, uh, and we were like not certain when we went there, but both of us kind of like, yeah, but it probably makes sense to just do it on the easy rig because the easy rig has this organic feel, but you can get super cinematic stable shots. So it's coming to those conclusions. Uh, maybe you don't have all the answers in the beginning you usually do not but certain times you do go out with the concept and you keep to that sometimes it changes some way into the story like for pearl of africa for instance most of the stuff was shot pretty wide but then in the hospital scenes i went like tele all the time just to get like a lot of stuff in the foreground and to get this intimacy going and also being like that in in that handheld environment you also get a little bit of shake that adds to the whole tension of the scene so think about how you do those things and set up rules for yourself in the in the production um, and then like when you have all that you start to have like a visual strategy that you can use to tell your story um, and that's when you go out and you start to look at like creating scene lists and shot lists and more whatever you, you're using. Um, but before that, you haven't done the work really where you can, can do that. Because you should watch films for inspiration to have these, okay, this is how I want it to look. Do those things because that will make it so much easier to hone in on something and keep it consistent. And for me, consistency is everything in terms of making anything cinematic. Like anything can be cinematic. 120p can be cinematic as long as there is like this consistency that adds to the story. But if you like lose people on the way, you know, you've not succeeded with that cinematic interpretation of life. Um, and like another thing that i think you should think about also is like to always be like having this pre-planned id as sure it's a blueprint but you probably need to throw it away if you don't work like that you're gonna get a story that feels forced and it's gonna feel like you know nothing is working as you shoot as well because you're always gonna be working against you know life like go with what happens, like try to add things and interpret things cinematically that is happening rather than like trying to create stuff that isn't there. I see that all the time where people are like trying to 
get these scenes because they set these like they envision stuff in their planning stage and then they can't get it and then they freeze they don't know what to do and you really need to be adapting and always reacting to what's happening and then changing everything um, to for the better i hope because uh, that's what makes it like super unique in the end like you having one idea and then having to problem solve to get to another that's where the creativity comes like the the more cre creative you are the better those problems will be for you and that's what finds your style because that's when you're forced to like go back to your perspective and your thoughts and really evolve from like what you you would be able to plan because usually what i plan as well is just like it's nothing special it's the problems that happens on site where things is just like messed up how you react and how you interpret things there is is you that's your storytelling um yeah and also like think about like how you can do stuff with the limitations embrace the limitations so i wouldn't complain if i just have a camera in a lab or whatever you have like use that as a way to create this cinematic story yeah. and also focus on the stuff beyond the action so just because people are like maybe the story is about one thing and it makes sense to shoot something in this and that way you need to capture life so to try to focus on seeing like what the life is behind whatever the story or theme or whatever it is is about try to go beyond that to go to a more universal like world where people on the other side of the world would understand this as well because when you're trying to to make it too focus on the little things you, you usually forget about like how this can be like a universal theme um yeah i think those are like the big things for me that you can start with um and then from there you're gonna evolve uh, i think it was yeah so christopher doyle is one of my favorite DOPs or he was at least when I was starting out uh, I think what is he saying he says that cinematography is uh, how to express a story in this space that's how he sees it um, and it's funny because he, he he's an Australian he's like worked in Asia all his career pretty much and that's his reference so he says that western cinema says uh, look at this look at this that i'm trying to show you you're so stupid i need to show you this while asian cinema says discover this so if you look at things in that perspective like try to get the audience to discover things and and try to get them curious to discover things that i think is it's crucial if you want to make something immersive um let's see so we pictures how much leniency do you allow for a story to take its own path versus predetermining the direction of the story i would say i i focus everything on like my vision until it doesn't work like i have a vision for the story and what it will be but then it, it like it never works that's just like the way it is so you get to a place you had envisioned a couple of scenes maybe these scenes will happen later like we had a couple of scenes that we had to like uh, just strike out now when we were in kino because it wasn't possible to get them now but there's still stuff that i want to do like further down the line but in this place that we were in now and like the logistics and we were there three days you just need to adapt it to what you're able to get at that moment. And then you have the reality of people just being unpredictable. So you need to adapt all the time to that. But I still have like a predetermined plan that I try to stick to. So as I have that plan, every day I go back and I reevaluate. Okay, what do we need to get? Okay, this, do we need to add anything? Do we need to strike anything out? Like that's an ongoing process all the time. And it's a conversation that you you have either with yourself or with the team all the time 
Uh, and that's what I think is like the, the most crucial thing is to always be questioning what you're doing because otherwise you just make like your film, especially if you come from the outside and try to make something, it's super important to, to be really like open to what's happening for real. Because you can have an idea and for instance, we came into this place through a journalist that had been there uh, and you're tainted by that story that you've read like we read an article in New York Times and that kind of tainted what we're trying to look for. And then when you get there for the first time, things start to change. And it changed in an interesting way for me because I was seeing it as one story in part of a bigger story. But then as we got there, we started to see like, this is a story in itself. Like we can do a whole TV series here because there's so much going on in this little town. So it, it becomes just being open to what's happening and then just making the best out of what's there uh, and just develop it to the stage where like it becomes something fantastic uh, yeah so let's see uh, documentary takes three years to make you mentioned does that uh, include shooting over three years before you get a decent footage or is it just in terms of editing color grading and waiting i mean that can vary a little bit but i think in general you you probably make a doc in like three years from start to finish if you're fast that's how fast you can make it like you can probably make it faster if you really want to but like good documentaries take that time to process and I think that that becomes natural as well because of the funding structures that are in the world. Like it takes a, a long time to fund a film. So for me, like I work a little bit different than most people do because I, I like to shoot straight away. So I, my research process is pretty much me shooting. And then as I shoot, I learn and I discover the story. And that's a bit harder to fund that way. So that's why we try to like fund it on ourselves first until we get to that uh, sizzle reel type of stage that we're at now, then it becomes easier to start to fund it for real. But before you're at that stage, it, it's really hard, especially if you, like now I'm established, so it's easier to get development grants. But before we were at that stage, we didn't get any funding until we had shot. Uh, uh, like, I think we've done, been in like Uganda f two times, so like a month in total. Um, before we got like a first little, I want to say 3K or something funding. So that didn't get us anywhere. It just solved like one trip to go in terms of costs. And it was just me going. So that's how cheap it was. But it kind of depends on on like how you're trying to make things. It, it, it's really hard to say how many years it takes because it's so dependent on what you do on the side as well. Nobody works for three years full time on anything. It's just that the process is on and off. The funding is on and off. The characters are on and off. Like it's so hard to get stuff done quicker than that. But I usually edit for a year on my projects. Uh, that's just the way I like it. Sometimes you get rushed because you need to meet a festival deadline or something like that. But nowadays, if you sell to Netflix, for instance, they probably want to recut it when you sell it to them. If you do like an original or something. So it, it kind of depends on those things as well. You might get a whole festival run and then they pick it up and then you, know, you, you need to do some more changes. And it can be so much longer than you would expect. But usually it takes like at least twice as long as you plan. That I can say. Uh, okay, so let me just see if I have some more tips I was thinking about. Um, yeah, this is kind of interesting because you always want to create intimacy between like the story and characters and the audience. That's what you're aiming for. Like when you work with the cinematic storytelling language that's what you try to achieve you want to create like an illusion of the audience being in the room with the story so being in that world 
And the more you think of it that way and trying to achieve that rather than just thinking about it in terms of like making it look good or whatever it is, the easier it becomes to do that. It's so freaking hard if you don't think about it in, in the terms of like the audience, I feel. Because I put myself in that position. Like I'm the audience as I edit. So if I don't feel things, then you know nobody will feel anything. Then you can be clouded by your own judgment as well. But that's a whole other bag. Um, but I really embrace like all the mistakes and failures and everything just because that pushes me in a in a unique direction. So you s might start with like references and stuff, and then as soon as you make a mistake, whatever your solution is usually becomes unique. So I would just try to embrace those and and look at it as like a way to to progress the story because when you start out you usually don't have a clue of how to progress the the visual narrative I think especially without uh, any experience. So the more mistakes you do the more you need to react and the more you need to solve things and the more you will make things unique is at least like how I experience it. Um, but also like I use grading a lot to create a look, but you can also like create atmosphere with like mood and sound, color, light, like all those things. But grading is such a good tool to create a consistency within your stuff as well. So if you want to use grading in a good way, I, I think it also can add to like the emotions of stuff, which I think often is like when you have something that looks too generic so let's say you have everything look like rec 709 that doesn't make it unique right it makes it look like anything else and if your intent is to build like a story world then look at like the films that are super uh, processed like for instance saving private ryan or films like that that has like a style embedded in it I'm not remembering what they did on that one. It was, was like cross-processing or something. But anyway, like look at films that have a unique style and how consistent it is. Like usually films have that consistency. I look towards, like for inspiration, I look at Hollywood and that type of stuff because they're so controlling in terms of how to create a cinematic style. Uh, but in terms of story and and like the immersion and and the intimacy and the emotions, I don't look at that. Then I rather look at like documentaries. So I'm trying to blend the two and I think most people are today. But uh, like when I made a feature film, like a fiction, we were trying to make it look like a doc. And I think that's a good way to approach it, to make it look, you know, somewhere in between. I don't see like a difference in them anyways. One is boring and one is not. That's the only difference I see. Um, another super important thing is to look at it at, uh, like even if you tell like if, this is about a trans woman from Uganda as you can see I'm pretty white and I'm pretty male so it's kind of hard for me to like put myself into her place and to be uh, like honestly so much part of it but as a filmmaker you have to like you have to put yourself into the story somehow and make it personal whatever that is like you need to discover things that are personal to you and use those uh, for me it was more around like say so questions i see like people in my surroundings asking and trying to get like those type of topics answered within the film and trying to explore that and and i think when when you work in a way that your personal interest becomes um or it shapes the story. It does that anyways when you ask the questions or when you choose the scenes and all that. Like you need to make it personal. I would say like the, the personal stuff for me is probably more about like the cinematic way that it's told because at that time I was more a DOP than I was a director. But just looking at how you can kind of put yourself into a story is super important and the best way i think is to make it personal from the beginning to just make it about you but everybody doesn't want to go out and make films about themselves but i think when you do that as soon as you make it personal the story evolves somehow just from you being able to be personal and open about things the hardest things 
around like documentaries is that you don't control anything you can't get them to say what you really want them to say and a lot of people move on to fiction because of that but i just think that you need to put that into like the cinematic language and and how you interpret things instead so the more you can control the cinematic language the more you can actually put your personal style and storytelling into it and uh, that makes a lot of difference i think when you're trying to to tell a story and make people actually feel something um, but then you also have like for instance the cultural upbringing and stuff that christopher doll is talking about in asia versus western countries like cultural upbringing matters in terms of what style and cinematic language you use so looking too much at hollywood will yeah it will be kind of boring in the end if everybody makes that type of film and it's the same if everybody makes 120p stuff or whatever um okay so can you talk about how to cut the story short and packaging a whole story into a short timeline and what is your workflow when it comes to uh, such a short uh, comes to taking scenes out uh love that you don't record video interviews i think uh, that's great for making a story fit a short timeline yeah i think in a way it comes down to experience to be able to kill your darlings like when i was i worked as an editor you you learn to not be fond of certain things like you have to throw things out and just start over and and just be really like abusive of the material and that's something that you get with the experience it, it can be kind of hard to do that uh, but working with somebody else i work with a separate editor on my first films so that's one way of doing it to get somebody else and to learn from them and to start like not being so fond of everything um, but it also comes down to focusing the story more like always be focusing it around the theme and like the the narrative that you're trying to to tell and find a story structure that makes sense and the more you focus it around that the less stuff that fills things out there should be um yeah and focus it along the along the log line for instance like just narrow it down okay so let me see how much time do i got okay so let me take two questions um mm -mm, let me see let me see okay so this one is a little, little bit uh, i said most of this but boyan asked like basic advanced explain conflict acts traditional and non-traditional storytelling uh how to achieve that with editing so I think I've touched upon most of it, but conflict is, is such an important thing to talk about because like if there is nothing at stake in a film, like nobody really cares about the characters or the story. So conflict, it can be somebody that's trying to like es escape torture or it can be like a forbidden love or whatever it is, like using that to create tension is crucial if you want to um, have people be engaged in your story and to care for like your characters uh, so i don't know how you do it it depends on the story but you have to focus things around that conflict all the time like every scene should according to robert mckee at least have that embedded in it like you should never have a scene without having the conflict be uh, part of it so that's the thing that drives the the momentum or the story forward i think that can be kind of hard to do that in docs because you're following real life and that's what makes it unique and i think sometimes that way of looking at things can feel forced but i do think that you always need to have that embedded as much as you can uh, so one example in in pearl of africa was that we had a a scene where they're just hanging out in the apartment and nothing really happens except for like okay so things are happening and they're calling and they're part of their activism is happening and and all that but 
nothing really happens it's just like it's happening but it's not happening there's nothing like you're not understanding or getting a deeper understanding of the story so in that we added actually um, instead of using archive material we used archive material as sound so uh, she's watching the television she's not actually watching the material that we're having play in the video she's actually watching something random on tv but to like get to the storyline in terms of like telling the story and showing the conflict always being in the scenes we actually put that archive material as she's watching tv so that you get the illusion of her watching it on the tv to get it more immersed into her storyline and to get it more part of being in the story world and to kind of that is one of those like reinterpretation of life so she's watched that but she's probably watched it on her computer and that sort of thing so you just need to like reinterpret it in the most cinematic way that you can with the material that you can have so you always need to like envision it in the situations you have and try to kind of uh, make that conflict be part of everything that you do so if you have that scene for instance the scene that follows that is her going to her either they go up on the mountain or they go to her sister i'm not sure but either way that scene is important to set up the scene that comes after where she goes out and she's you know out in the open you get more feel for like her safety as she goes out but if you didn't have that as an obvious kind of setup for that next scene where you're she's going out and is she going to be attacked you get that feeling then you're not going to have anybody following along uh, in the story so that's how i would look at it uh, okay, so last question. Mm. Here we go. Okay, so Saulo asks, Hello, your videos and documentaries stand out uh, for the beautiful composition, image, quality and color. Uh, it's a strong element in the way you tell stories cinematically. Maybe the new Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera is the best option for the price for independent filmmakers to be capturing more professional quality images and sound for documentaries. What's your opinion on that? What other cameras would you recommend for those who are not a pro video camera yet? If you could also recommend a zoom lens companion for the Pocket 4K. Uh, the most cinematic look, yes. Uh, yeah i think the pocket 4k is perfect for anybody that wants to tell like cinematic stories cheap the old one as well no oh yeah andre has it so like there's i think you you can do that with most cameras today um, but i think if you have an intention of working like more with cinematic uh, like cinema styled cameras and if you want to work more like uh, a DUP works with like switching lenses and working with certain focal lengths and when you really get like to be a cinematographer that type of, of way then the pocket and the black magic like all those cameras are a really good ecosystem for that and it's not only that but also like the the system that you get for post-production like it's post friendly especially with the new black magic raw for instance you can edit like it's ProRes, but it's raw um, so I worked with that on the Ursa for instance and it's just so snappy compared to everything else like it's in, insane how they did that I don't even know but when you get that on a camera that's the pocket you, you get pretty much the same camera as you would in a red or in a Ursa or whatever it is but you get it in a small package that is micro four thirds so for me that's perfect like that would be a beginner filmmaking camera for me um, but now i just see it as like my probably a cam a lot of the time because i don't want a big camera so i have an a cam for big productions which is the earth and then i had that a cam from cert for certain productions and the other ones it's going to be a b cam so I would say that's perfect camera for that because it doesn't compress much uh, it has high dynamic range it has the post workflow yeah all those things um 
But then, like, uh, you also had the light sensitivity. So for docs, it's, it's perfect. Um, but outside of that, I think I'm not a big fan of the, the um, speed boosters. I have one for my pocket, but I don't use it. I think it kind of it, it ruins the whole point of having a small camera. I like having the small lenses for it. Like I, I want to use this one, but I don't know if it will work. So tiny. It's a mere 20 millimeter. This is a vintage lens. It's super cheap. So, but it has nice bokeh. But anyway, these small lenses, they're so much more fun to have and you can get like certain looks with them and all that i just like the opportunity of working with like tiny gear that is more like tailored to create a style like when you choose a lens like this you you choose it for the look just like you would like film stock or or whatever you would uh, in the good old days or in the big blockbuster nowadays it's just a matter of like the camera in itself when you can mount these it creates a style it, 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 i just like vintage lenses so but if you want to use a speed booster i love my sigma 18 to 35 as well it's like super sharp it's so low light sensitive like it's perfect for a camera that wants a big uh, lens like that i just like that one it's so like underpriced it's crazy they could charge so much more for it but other than that i mostly use like this one this is like a pancake zoom lens that can even focus manually everything is autofocus 12 to 32 like a really crappy lens most of the stuff that i shoot is on this one that's vlogging or tutorial stuff or whatever i just find it so practical i don't want to use anything else you just need this like how simple is that yeah so it, it kind of depends I, I don't think that you have to have a certain thing to be able to shoot anything it, like you can use anything uh, it comes down to other things like it comes down to you being consistent and creating this cinematic style and everything i think that's so much more important to kind of uh, put things together into your vision and to like and package that into something that uh, translates to the audience that's what cinematic is to me anyways um, and the dance between like you as a dp and uh, and the action and characters and everything like that dance is pretty much what creates the immersion as well if you're able to like move with the subjects in a certain way it can either like get people to get go out of the story or they can lean in in, in that type of way as well okay that's gonna be it for this one but yeah, let me know um, comment what you think is like the stuff that i missed or uh, what you value the most in terms of cinematic uh, storytelling and uh, how to make it better more effective for docs okay see you soon bye bye